Hey everybody and welcome to the UFC on ESPN Plus 19, Joanna versus Waterson Aftermath. Man, these things are a mouthful. Um, anyway, b- really good night of fights. I mean, the main card was incredible. The prelims were pretty exciting. Uh, just to rattle off and let you guys know the results of the prelims, uh, JJ Aldridge defeated uh, Lauren Mueller via unanimous decision and that was a good fight. Um, not the most thrilling fight in the world, but you really got to see Aldridge put her technical uh, competencies on display there and her last law lo- i think her last fight was against macy barber in which she lost but she was really dotting barber up and exposed a lot of holes in macy's game that needs cleaned up before she moves on to her next fight <clears throat> actually macy has a fight coming up this weekend i'm moving through the fights right now for uh, the weidman and reyes card and uh, she's on it so we'll be talking about her more later in the week marvin vittori beat andrew sanchez this was a fight where i actually like when i saw the odds i put a little bit of money on sanchez just because i thought the odds were I mean, obviously I was wrong, but I thought that Sanchez with his cardio and his wrestling base and everything would have more of a chance to get Vittori to the ground, and it didn't play out that way. Vittori looked brilliant. He fought a great fight, and he won all three rounds. Um, Miguel Baeza defeated Hector Aldana via TKO in the second round. Uh, I think that was a leg kick. And, uh, you know, Aldana just couldn't eat anymore. Man went down, and he jumped on him and finished him. Marlon Chito Vera defeated Andre Ull in a good fight. And, again, man, Vera just put in – Putting the work on Yule, and it was a good fight, but Vera just a little more technical, quicker to the punches. Um, Davis and Figueredo, I think he's only got one loss in his entire career, and he kept it that way when he beat Tim Elliott. Guillotined him in the first round. Uh, Alex Morono defeated Max Griffin via unanimous decision. That was a good fight in which, I mean, in that fight, Griffin got clipped with a head kick, and I don't know how the fuck he stayed up, man. Uh, this is a fight that everybody's talking about, right? Mike Davis versus Thomas Gifford. And Mike Davis stepped in to take this fight on a uh, short notice. And he ends up going in as a massive underdog. And I mean, he, he put it on Gifford, man. I mean, that ref, they actually ended up pulling the ref. They didn't let him ref. I, I forget which fight he was supposed to officiate, but they didn't let him do it. The Florida Commission pulled him off, and I thought it was a smart move. I mean, he let Gifford take a fucking beating. And then the way he got knocked out in the third – Oh man, it was like it was almost heartbreaking because you knew that fight should have been stopped and maybe like midway through the second and then even if not then when you saw the way the third round was going you got to you got to step in and intervene. I mean, the kid wasn't defending himself. You're there to protect the fighter. You got to step in and do your job. So, I mean, I hate to I hate to be talking shit on refs because it's a hard fucking job and when you've got a guy with heart like Gifford, you you want to give him the benefit of the doubt, right? And like what if he did have a comeback? But man, he he was getting it taken to him and he was taking some big fucking shots and he took a lot of unnecessary ones so ref's got to be better there i don't want to attack him or anything but i mean that's a learning moment for that guy he's got to go back and reevaluate and understand what it means for a guy to be defending himself and then uh ryan span pulled off a guillotine over devin clark in the second round in the uh headlining bout of the prelim card and now let's move on to the main card because these are the ones i broke down and the ones that i want to talk about um Eric Anders picked up a split decision over Gerald Mearshart, and this was a fucking this was a really close fight. And uh, if I was judging it, I probably would have gave it to Mearshart. I felt like Anders came out, won the first, but then Mearshart just he, he he fought that fight like a veteran should fight a young guy. He stayed composed. He never looked out of place. I mean, he took some big shots, but he just kept his cool, kept his distance, and started picking Anders apart, man. I thought he was landing the cleaner shots for the second and third. He hurt Anders really bad in the third round. That body kick is working for him. It was a close fight, man. I'm not saying either guy got robbed, but um, personally, I probably would have gave the fight to Mearshart. But uh, some things that me- – I was talking – What one of the things that I thought that Anders had to do was apply calculated pressure, right? And – I think I was a little bit wrong in saying that. I think he was a little bit too calculated. When you're fighting a guy like Mearshart, he's – I mean, Anders ended up picking up the win, don't get me wrong, but I thought he was getting outpointed at times. And when you're fighting a guy like that, sometimes you just got to overwhelm the technicalities with aggression and kind of get in his face a little bit, you know. So I would like to see Anders with his power and size take a few more chances. I don't want him going in there and just swinging wild and praying and, you know what I mean, hoping that he connects with something, but – in that Mearshard fight, I think he could have done a little more and he could have hurt Mearshard at times, but he was letting, being a little too hesitant, and that was letting Mearshard get off on him. You know, find his range and start really hitting him with that jab. And uh, it, like I said, it was a close fight. You can't get too hung up about this one. Um, it could have gone either way. 
Uh, I thought Mearshart deserved the win, but it's subjective. And uh, Anders did hurt him in the first round pretty bad and knocked him down. So definitely won the first, but I give the second and third to Mearshart. Good fight either way. Like I said, Anders is getting – I mean, he's always fighting vets, it seems like, and he's tough as hell, but – Impose that will on the guy a little bit more. You know what I mean? I think I, I think that Mearshart was probably expecting that because he didn't shoot a whole lot during that fight. I think he was expecting the uh, when the pressure came, that's when he would be able to open up the takedowns when you got Anders reaching on stuff and overextending, and it just never came, so the nature of the fight was that it stayed on the feet. This was my pick for fight of the night. The next one coming up, Matt Frivola versus Luis Pena, and this is also the fight that's getting what seems to be the most amount of controversy online. Okay, so when I, w- I went back and watched this fight because I felt like it wasn't one of those fights that you could – you couldn't watch that fight one time and unless you were specifically looking at it to score it. I mean, if you were enjoying it as a fan, you can't watch that fight one time and call it robbery one way or the other, right? So I went back and watched it, and I felt like the fir- every, all, all the rounds except the second were close. Pena decidedly won the second, and it was obvious. It's when he landed that big knee and rocked him. He was just looking technical. He was on point. But Frivola landed two big takedowns in the first. I understand that Pena recovered from them. He was rocking Pena, and he was more aggressive through the first half of the round. I think it was like at literally the 230 mark that Pena started getting off on Frivola. But that's like when he landed his first crisp combination, I remember thinking. And I... Uh, Frivola was being more aggressive. And I think that, that it, like, you got to realize that when you're watching fights, it's subjective. Like, different things mean different things to different people. Like, different mo- different maneuvers and stuff. And uh, landing and hurting a guy and just your aggression might mean more to one judge than another, right? So, I felt like... If you're talking about who landed the cleaner shots and who fought a cleaner fight, it was definitely Pena. But I thought this fight was closer to a draw than anything. I thought if I was being honest when I went back and rewatched it, I would have gave the first round to Matt Frivola. He was coming out. He was looking for takedowns. He was headhunting. He caught Pena a couple times with some big shots. And what, he was looking bad at the end of the first round, but I thought he won a majority of the first round. Pena, hands down, won the second. No doubt about it. I mean, that was the most decisive round of the fight. But in the third, if you look at the stats, I'm pretty sure that Frivola just narrowly outlanded uh Pena and he was being more aggressive he was pushing forward and he was hitting Pena with some big fucking shots did Pena fight the cleaner fight 100% I think he had his technique was more crisp he was more sound it was probably more what you would look like it it was prettier but I think Provola went in there and he fought like a dog in the third round and I, I mean don't get me wrong I I, I can I, this fight could have gone either way but it was no it was by no means a robbery no way Luis Pena fought a great fight. Like I said, I thought he looked good. I thought he fought a prettier fight. I thought he was he was really yeah, he was finding the range well. He was doing well on the ground. He had he, I thought he had him beat in certain areas, but I thought Favola just thought fought a more aggressive fight. And um landed some really big shots on Pena in the third. And man, I I mean, go back and watch it. And if, if you've only seen the fight once, I go back and watch it, right? Just see what you think after watching it a second time because I think it's closer than a lot of people think it is. Like I said, third round could have gone either way, but I can. Un- it's, I'm not saying that I would have done this. I, I would have to sit down and like judge it, like actually try to judge it and assess what I think everything is worth. But I can understand how judges gave the third round, the third and first round to Frivola. I really can. I thought it was a way closer fight than people were making out to be. It wasn't this like robbery, and. uh yeah, hats off to Matt Favola, man. He was a dog. He fought a great fight in that. Amanda Heboss uh, handed Mackenzie Dern her first loss in the next fight. And uh, this was – I kind of contradicted myself when I predicted this fight, right? Because I kind of thought that inevitably this fight was going to end up on the ground. And it's ironic that I said that because when I was talking about Crone Gracie, I was mentioning the fact that sometimes jiu-jitsu players struggle with their takedowns. And um, it, it ended up staying on the feet. And Amanda Hebos was way more technical, way more efficient with her strikes, no fat on them, whereas Mackenzie Dern was winging stuff. And then it was in like the second or third round. Amanda hit Mackenzie with a beautiful judo toss, beautiful hip toss. And uh, Mackenzie quickly covered guard, but that, that, that kind of stuff matters. You know what I mean? Like Amanda controlled the entire pace of the fight and negated anything that Mackenzie would have been able to do on the ground. So it was a great performance from her. 
I definitely underestimated Amanda's ability to keep it on the feet. And, um, yeah, she looked brilliant. She's definitely a rising contender. I mean, she looked her, her she looked really fucking good in that fight, and she really put it on Mackenzie. And you know, Mackenzie goes out there and winks punches. To, so to stay away from that power, that was an that, an outstanding performance. I mean, you, she still went to the she went to the ground with her. She was able to land the I think the only takedown on the fight on Mackenzie. So brilliant performance, and uh, she's also got a fun personality. She's a pretty girl. I mean, she's got a bright future if things continue going for her the way they the way they went on Saturday. Ooh, the next fight, Nico Price defeats James Vick via upkick in the first round. And I picked Nico Price in this fight, and I can't I mean, don't I would have never fucking predicted this. Don't get me I did not predict an upkick in the first round to knock out James Vick, but my thing with Vick is he's a tall, rangy guy, and he doesn't he, he doesn't have the best defense, in my opinion. He leaves a lot of openings, and to me, Nico Price is just a he he's a fucking pro at capitalizing on any little opening that you give him. If you look at his knockout over Randy Brown, right? Just look, go out and watch his knockouts. He fights wild. He fights fucking crazy. So, to me, I I thought James Vick could have done things to win this fight, and he was looking good at points. And you would have thought that James Vick was in an advantageous position tonight, right there. And Nico just fucking stunned him, man. And he hit him hard, and it wasn't like he just knocked him out. I mean, James Vick was knocked out cold. And how many times has it happened to him now? Happened against Gaethje. Happened against Hooker. Now it's happened against uh, Nico Price. Took a tough decision loss to Paul Felder. That's four fights in a row for James Vick. And I mean, just being completely objective, you've got about you've got to wonder about the security of that kid's UFC career. And in all honesty, if you when you've taken four losses in a row, let me look up how old James Vick's, Vick is because I don't think he's that old. I want to say he's under 30, but I, I could be wrong. 32. Okay, so, I mean, you're talking about a guy in his prime. Um, probably got a – I mean, Paul Felder's 34, still fighting great, right? Like, you can fight into your mid-30s, early 40s sometimes, especially if you're a heavyweight, right? But uh, Vick has got to go out to, a, like, a lesser organization, I think, and go get his confidence back because, I, I mean, four losses – how do you keep a guy on, on the roster with four losses in a row? Um it's hard to convince people, I think, to take a fight with him because he's not a huge name. And uh, I think Vic is an extreme talent. I mean, he's got a lot of he's got length on a lot of guys in that division. He's massive. I just think he needs to work on shoring stuff up. If he's not let go from the UFC, man, I'd like to see him take an extended layoff and really work on some things. He needs to work on defending himself. I think we know that he can fight offensively. We know he has knockout power. We know he can submit people. But it's just like. He gets into situations where guys can hit him, and with that reach, he's got to he's got to learn to utilize that more and use it to his advantage. Um, so we'll see. I'd I'd like to see Vic take an extended period of time off, and I'd like to see Nico Price come back. And I think he, who is he calling out? Did he call out Mike Perry? That would be a great fucking fight because those two go to war. Um, that's a fight of the night contender if it gets announced. Man, a, a lot of a lot. Of, Nico Price is one of those guys who's only lost two fights, and I can't remember off the top of my head who they're two. He got knocked out brutally in one of the bouts, and I can't remember how to pronounce the guy's name. And then who is his other law? I can't remember off the top of my head. But the point is, is that Nico Price is very talented. He finds ways. He find he finds a way to win. Um Regardless of the position that you put him in, it seems like he can finish a fight from almost anywhere. Uh, and a lot of promise, man. A lot of pro- I can't remember if this fight took place at 170 or 155 pounds. This might have been the first jump for James Vick to 170, and uh, didn't go according to plan, if so. And then in the main event, Cub Swanson defeats Crone Gracie. And going into this fight, there was a lot of rumor going around, and Cub Swanson confirmed this in an interview that I saw after that. Um, Gracie Jiu Jitsu schools were denying him access because he was fighting a Gracie and uh I thought that I I don't come from Gracie lineage right so I don't hold the same values that they do but to me that just seems so bizarre I mean if you think about what Cub Swanson think about think about a what Cub has accomplished and how respected he is in his UFC and MMA career right he's a legend in the sport he's loved by all the fans he's I mean from what I've seen in interviews he's a hell of a nice guy very well respected within the MMA community and I understand that you are fighting a Gracie, but jiu-jitsu has grown so much. And think about how many guys that he personally, just him alone, has probably influenced to start doing jiu-jitsu or martial arts in some type of way. 
and the contributions that he's probably made to the sport, whether you want to acknowledge them or not, are probably pretty monumental. And to deny him entry to train, I mean, if Crone Gracie was training at that gym, completely understandable, right? Like if he was going around and getting working with those guys. But if he's not, man, the, to me, the beauty of martial arts is that you can share it. And I think that when you share it, it makes everyone better, right? It brings everyone up around you because uh, everything's cyclical, man. Everything has a counter. So when somebody d- figures something out, somebody figures out how to defend it, and then it just keeps going and going. That's how it grows continuously all the time. So when you start limiting who can come into your gyms, I mean, obviously, like I said, if it was like a fight where he, he was trying to get into a gym that Crone was training at for some reason, that makes perfect fucking sense. But, I mean, it, just any Gracie gyms were denying him access. All the, I mean, to me, that seems off, man. It seems It seems wrong, especially because... It's not what to me to me, and I'm not a Gracie man, but to me that's not what jujitsu and martial arts should be about. It should be about inclusion and making everybody better. And then seeing what two guys in a fight like this, what they look like when they're competing at their very best. That's what you want, right? Isn't it? You, you don't want to stunt one guy's growth and have somebody like you don't want to fight a depleted version of a guy. You want to beat him at its best. That's the, that's what we're that's what we're representing here. When you when you talk about martial arts, you want to see two guys who are at the top of their game, well-conditioned, and they're ready to throw down. So, I mean, if you're limiting somebody's knowledge, to me, you're limiting them. And then you're, you're not getting a true representation of what the person's capable of when they step into the cage. Just my take. Anyway, Cub Swanson had lost four fights in a row before this. Biggest skid of his career. I think he lost two in a row once to, like, Edgar and Jose or Edgar and Holloway. Something like that. And, uh... This was big for him, man. I mean, to, if going f- losing five in a row would have been a rough go. And um, I, I, I think he won all three rounds. The second round, in my opinion, was the closest. But in the first and third, Cub really took over. Really working the body, mixing the striking up. I, know, I don't know if you noticed, but I, I, I said one of the keys for Cub in this would be to stay mobile. And uh, I think that was true. And I think Cub was doing a very good job of that in the first round. And then he slowed down. But also... I think Cub just didn't feel a threat of a takedown. So why waste all your energy moving around? Like, you, I don't think it was exhaustion because his strikes were still looking good. I mean, everybody gets tired in the third round, especially when you're throwing the volume those guys were throwing. But I saw Crone Gracie said after the fight that he won. No, he fucking didn't. Not a chance. I'm sorry. I mean, uh, much respect to them and the family and, like, everything he's accomplished in jiu-jitsu, but he didn't win that fight. Cub Swanson whomped on him. It was a... I mean, that's a tough fight for Crone Gracie. That's the highest profile fighter, a veteran of the game. And I mean, this is only Crone's sixth MMA fight. And I think learning some takedowns would have served him well. He did put some of that Stockton boxing on display in the fight. You know, it's not exactly pretty. He doesn't. And one, one thing that I did notice in the fight, and this was the difference maker for Cub landing his strikes and Crone not being able to footwork, footwork. Cub Swanson led the dance the whole fucking night. And Crone was always chasing him. He might land, but he was chasing Cub and it allowed Cub to counter every time he threw. I mean, footwork is probably the single most important thing in striking. Because if you're out of position, man, you're going to get caught. And Cub just did a great job of always being in position. Even when he did get hit, he was returning fire and put on a brilliant display, man. And what a way to get back on track. Crone Gracie needs to work on that striking a little bit. Work on the footwork, you know? You know, get used to moving with guys that are a little bit faster and learn how to cut them off. You got to head them off instead of following them around the cage. If you're following them, they're leading the dance. Um, but congrats to Cub Swanson. I'm sure he's going to get a, another, bi- a good, another big fight after this. 145-pound division, along with almost every division in the UFC, is really fucking hot right now. So good to see Cub get back on track and hopefully a moment for Crone Gracie to kind of realize, like, I mean, obviously – him get, being denied entry to the gym didn't change the outcome of the fight. I mean, he still fucking won. He didn't even go, right? So, whatever. And then uh, in the main event, Yoani and Chechek defeats Michelle Waterson. And this was a pretty one-sided fight. I mean, there were moments in the fight where Michelle had Yoana in trouble. I think she had her back twice. But nothing that ever made you really feel like Yoana was, like, about to lose, right? Yoana was in control of everything. I mean, her her technique is just perfect. And her relentlessness and her ability to push forward and defend takedowns. And she's good everywhere, man. One of the best in the world. And what's probably, I I, I mean, that was a a dominant performance from one of the greatest female combatants of all time. I mean, to me, 
that performance right there against a rising contender and Michelle Watterson was probably enough to earn her a title shot against Wei Li Zong, and that's a great fucking fight. I think Wei Li's lost one fight coming off that brutal knockout of Jessica Andrade. Um, and I think that these are the two best women in the world at 115 pounds right now. And this is... <sighs> The problem with Michelle Watterson is that she beats up on a lot of girls at 115 pounds, but in that fight, I think she was just a little small, whereas, like, Ioana has fought girls like Valentina. And I, I hate to extend the MMA math out this far, but Valentina has fought girls like Amanda Nunes and Holly Holm, you know what I mean? So, Ioana got beaten in that fight, but Valentina was a little bit bigger than her, and I thought Ioana looked a lot bigger than Michelle. Michelle's probably a girl who needs to fight at 105 at, like, Adam weight, which is what I think she's fought at previously and earlier in her career. But either way, impressive win and an impressive performance from Michelle and what fucking heart to stay in there. You know what I mean? I mean, she was getting dotted up in there, but she was landing her own shots too and always, always doing what she could to try to get back in the fight. And, I mean, you got to see some true warrior spirit put on display there and all throughout this fucking card, man. This was a great fucking card. I mean, for, uh, for free, I know you have to sign up for the ESPN Plus subscription, but there's so many fucking fights that these make it worth it. This fight right here paid my this, – this was – this card right here – is worth your money for the ESPN Plus subscription. <laughs> I'm not getting paid to say that or anything, obviously, right? I got like 55 fucking subscribers. I, I, I believe that, though. I mean, when you get a card like this, it makes your whole entire ESPN Plus subscription worth it. Um, it's like five bucks a fucking month. Cough up, pay the 60 bucks, and man, then you get a ton of these, too. I mean, this is, what, the 19th card that they've had on ESPN Plus this year? And we probably got, like, what, at least three or four more to go before the year closes. Um... I think that's pretty much all, all I wanted to get through today. I just wanted to do a brief recap. I'm, uh, I'm working my way through the fights so that I can do some picks for ESP UFC on ESPN6, which is going to be headlined by Chris Weidman and Reyes. Let me pull that card up and read through the fights on it real quick. There's some really good fights on this card as well. Darren Stewart versus Darren Wynn. Darren Wynn, who did, Darren Wynn just came out of a war with somebody, and I can't fucking remember who it is. Macy Barber versus J Gillian. Gillian? Probably Gillian, but it's spelled with a G, so I'm fucking confused. Gillian Robertson. Joe Lozon versus Jonathan Pierce. Greg Hardy's fighting. Ben Sassoli. Yair Rodriguez and Jeremy Stevens are rematching in the co-main event after that eye poke. And uh, Dominic Reyes is fighting Chris Weidman in the headliner. Kyle Bokniak's fighting on the prelims. Um, not a ton of other recognized Kevin Holland's fighting on the prelims he's a fun guy to watch I mean Boston Salmon Salmon I don't fucking know man I struggle with names anyway though like I said I think that's all I wanted to get through um, give us a follow on Instagram at MMA.analysis hit the like button leave comments below uh, especially I want to hear what you guys think about the Frivola and the Pena fight um, let me know what you thought of my take on that uh, I think that's probably probably the most controversial fight of the entire card. And I thought it was a lot closer than people were making it out to be. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, hit the subscribe button if you guys like what you heard so you can keep up to date. We're on iTunes, Google Play. The podcast is the audio version. Uh, if you're listening to the audio version, we're also on YouTube at Mixed Martial Analysis. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in. I appreciate it. Bye-bye.